What makes Keene special? I feel like Keene is such a special place because it's so family oriented. It is such a wonderful place to raise a family. It's a perfect size. It's the size that you can actually volunteer and do something and actually make a difference. It's, a, it's that place that uh, you, you find by accident and come back on purpose. It's the place that you just saw in a Hallmark movie and you go, I wish I could live there. And when you drive through Keene, you're actually there. It's big enough but yet not so big that you don't remember people and you, you know, you constantly see people that you know. It's got the right combination of location, population, isolation to, to really create a community that is unique. It's unlike any other. The amount of social capital that exists here in Keene, the corporate uh, support with community businesses, people who come together for a better common good. The people people who are willing to give of themselves, the number of volunteers. I believe that the people in Keene are really special and that ref is reflected in Keene and its beauty. And we have a great downtown. And that's the other thing that I love about it is you just drive through there anytime and people are walking the streets. I think downtown Keene is by far the most beautiful downtown in all of New England. And I've been to a lot of downtowns doing a lot of research. so. Um, Keene not only has a really special place in my heart, but it is an extraordinary place to live and has extraordinary people. I'm Nancy Sporborg, and I'm the founder of the Keene Pumpkin Festival. So I worked at National Grange Mutual. I worked there for 12 years, and um, I loved it. I kind of grew up professionally in National Grange Mutual, but I got to the place in my life where it wasn't fulfilling some deep spot in me, and so I decided to leave. And at the time, downtown Keene was really struggling. Um, a lot of stores were closed. Um, stores were boarded up, the windows were boarded up, it was pretty quiet downtown, you didn't see people walking, there was not a lot of traffic, there was not a lot of parked cars. It was a pretty depressed downtown at that time. Keene at that time was sort of a ho-hum, falling asleep uh, or going into a coma. Something you just drove through. You didn't stop downtown for anything. It was such a cool little downtown, but it had stores boarded up and no reason to go there. And the Chamber of Commerce ran an ad. They were looking for someone to do cooperative advertising in downtown Keene. And I applied for the job <laughs> and I went to the interview and I have no idea where this came from, but I just said to them, you don't need somebody to run cooperative advertising for you. You need somebody who's going to bring life and vitality to downtown Keene. We have the most beautiful downtown you could ever hope to have, and it's depressed and it's um, hurting, and it needs some life. It needs some new life. And they looked at me and they kind of nodded and they said, well, sounds good, Nance, but that's not what we want. If you want to do that, you go ahead and try. So Nancy was uh, going door to door to downtown merchants trying to interest them. I spent a year of my life going around to every single store and every single owner in downtown Keene asking them if they would be willing to be a part of an effort. I called it the Downtown Association to, you know, bring life and vitality to downtown Keene. The idea was to have free events in downtown Keene to bring people into downtown. So we started brainstorming and one day in a meeting, I just looked at everybody and I said, hey, what if we lined downtown Keene with pumpkins? And they looked at me and I looked at them. I, I, I didn't know where the, if, where the idea came from. It just, it just came. I remember when Nancy 
Sporberg got the idea of having a, a pumpkin fest and we're all going, yeah, okay, sure, why not? So we started planning this, what we called at first the Harvest Festival. And the idea was to have jack-o'-lanterns everywhere and to have hay bales and, you know, country music and petting zoo and that type of thing. It was like, well, I mean, the college does their thing and the community does their thing and all the organizations do their own thing, but we never all came together. And so um, I got a call and was asked if I would be on the original committee. The big obstacle was that we had to get permission to put um, jack-o'-lanterns in downtown Keene. And so um, I was told that I had to go to the fire department. So I dressed up in my little pink suit and I went over to the fire department and um, I stood there with the chief and five um, fire guys and I said, you know, we're really excited. We formed this new downtown association and we run, run a harvest festival and we want to have pumpkins all over downtown Keene and in Central Square. And I stopped and I looked at the guys and the guys all looked at me and then they looked at the chief and the chief looked at me and he said, there's absolutely no way you're going to put even one lit jack-o'-lantern in downtown Keene. And, um, I wear my heart on my sleeve, so I had to, everything I could do not to cry. So I left the fire department, and then I cried. The city was not really up for this. I go to the city council meeting, and all the city councilors are there, and quite a few people from Keene were there, and the whole back row is firemen dressed up and, um, you know, tapping their feet, looking at me. It was pretty intimidating. And uh, I just gave it my best shot. I explained what I wanted to do with the pumpkins in downtown and that the city, that the fire department had said no and would the city be willing to override the fire department's decision? And they voted and they said yes. I want to point out my shirt because this is one of the original Jacks. I had a wonderful assistant working here named Katie then and um, Katie drew the original Jack. Jack, Jack, the little jack-o'-lantern with his little kind of sad eyes. And he's, he's still with us. So the pumpkin festival, or harvest festival at that time was on. So we just, we planned the event. It was really, really fun. We did not close down the streets, but we had about 600 jack-o'-lanterns in downtown Keene. And we had hay bales everywhere. We had music. We had um, a, a wagon ride that was going around downtown. We had a petting zoo. Um, all kinds of things. And we had trick-or-treating for the kids. Um, we had a mini little parade for the kids. And it went over a whole weekend. It was all very exciting. There were lots of people everywhere. And I was walking around downtown and all of a sudden, I was approaching Central Square. And in Central Square, I saw there were four or five men, all very dressed up. And a couple of them had cameras and I'm like, oh yeah. The news is here, we're gonna be on the news. I'm so excited. So I just beelined it right to Central Square. I put out my hand, you know, to greet these you know, the guys from the news. And um, all of a sudden I realized that it was Bill Clinton. I didn't know at the time who Bill Clinton was. And this was early, this is 1991. I put out my hand and he had this Bill Clinton for president, you know, um, pin on. And I said, oh, you're campaigning. And he said, yes. And I, I said, well, this is a, you know, it's a, it's a community event. This is, it's not a, a political event. And he said, nodded, he kind of nodded. And he walked over to one of the benches on Central Square and there were two kids dressed up um, in Halloween costume. And he got behind them and the photographers started pay, taking pictures of Clinton with these kids. And I got really mad because first of all, he was, he didn't get permission from the kids and again it's about pumpkins not presidential candidates so i went over to him and i said this is not your party <laughs> and he i said this is a community event i said if the if all the people who are running for president were here campaigning the families wouldn't be here and he looked at me and at that point i was i was saying to myself, oh my God, what have I just said? So I started to, you know, walk away, like 
I was saying to myself, Nancy, you've said too much, walk away, walk away. So I started walking away and out of the corner of my eye, I saw that Bill Clinton was following me. And I was like, oh my God. And I walked faster away from him because I was a wimp. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see him walking faster too. And his tie was going back and forth. He's walking so fast. So finally I realized I got to stop and face the music. And so I turned around and he approached me and he shook my hand and he said, you're absolutely right. I'm leaving. And he left. It was really spectacular. It was small. It was really a nice family feel. Um, but it was really fun to watch the kids. I think the city of Keene was really amazed at having this event that was free, that brought kids and people downtown. It was, a, it was just an amazing success. The community came together and worked at something none of us had ever done. And it worked. What I realized was that um, the downtown merchants had a really hard time supporting me, had a hard time volunteering. It's not that they didn't want to support me, they did, but they owned stores and they needed to be in their stores because I was having all the kids trick-or-treating in the stores and I became a woman on a mission looking for an organization to really be the home of uh, the Harvest Festival and any other events that we ran. I've been a friend of Nancy's for a long time, and she created a luncheon where she invited all of the businesses downtown to come. It was held at this hist historical society. And um, I'll just never forget it, because in typical Nancy style, she's just so vivacious and so full of energy. And she came to this luncheon with a black umbrella. And I opened up the black umbrella, and I had pinned to each of the spokes on the black umbrella this bright pink tag and on each pink tag it said all the benefits of having an alive thriving downtown that you'd have more people and more business and more excitement and all of those things and so I got to the meeting and I opened up my black umbrella and I put it over my shoulder and I started twirling the black umbrella and I just with everything I had sold the idea of bringing downtown Keene to to bring it more life and joy and exuberance and people and business and all of those things. I mean, she was flying high. She was so upbeat about everything that it was infectious. And they said yes. So they um, asked who on the on Keen Property Owners Association wanted to be a part of the initial board. And I got uh, four or five awesome people. So we met there in this tiny little room. There were only like five or six of us and we were all given foosballs. So if you said something that was negative, everybody bombarded you with a foosball. And we started Center Stage Cheshire County. We got our 501c3 and I had a board of directors and I was ready to go. I was trying to figure out a way to, to, to make it even more exciting. So you don't do the next one and try and tone it down some. It's like, well, if we got 600 and some odd, maybe we could get eight or 900. And I thought, hey, what if we, what if we could set a Guinness World Record for having the largest number of lit jack-o'-lanterns? And now we've got an added little extra. We are going to try to set a national world record by having the largest number of lit jack lanterns in one place at one time. And we can do that. So I called Guinness, and they sent me to um, their Guinness office in New York City. He basically said to me, no, no, no. He said, we, we're not interested in new records. We're really only interested in people working on existing records. So I just kept calling him. I just decided I was going to be a thorn in his side. And I just kept saying to him, listen, if we set a world record, everybody in Keene who was part of the event is going to buy a book. In my mind, I just said, I know this could work. I just planned the event as if Guinness had said yes. So we set up log books. We were going to have people log their pumpkins in, sign their name, write how many pumpkins they brought, so that we could actually keep track of the number of jack-o'-lanterns. And on the day of the festival, I had a message 
from the Guinness Book of World Records in New York City saying they were very interested in what we were doing and that they wanted to help us in every way they could. Could I please give them a call first thing this morning? Yes. Guinness World Records called me and said, yes, you're a go, we'll do it. So the community was really excited. Everybody carved their jack-o'-lanterns. They came downtown, they logged them in, and um, we counted them, 1,628. We sent all the books to Guinness, and Guinness sent me this beautiful uh, certificate saying that we had set the first world record for the largest number of lit jack-o'-lanterns. It was really exciting. So by 1993, you know, we'd run the festival two years. By 1993, I recognized that this wasn't really about a harvest festival. This was about the pumpkins. We changed the name to the Keen Pumpkin Festival. And we started planning our third event. And one of the things that I was very, very clear about, as was the board of directors, was that this event was about benefiting this community. So we decided that we were going to offer vendors, offer food, because people wanted food. I wanted food. And, um, but instead of just opening it up to just vendors, we decided that we would open it up only to nonprofit organizations that exist here in Keene and Cheshire County and give them the opportunity to sell food so that they could make a profit and benefit their organizations. We have so many nonprofit organizations in this town who could fund their organizations for a year and we had youth interact uh, clubs and we had Lions clubs and we had local businesses that just would really uh, benefit so greatly from this. And it went from a few all the way up to 42 or three uh, nonprofit organizations. And on a good day, as the pumpkin festivals got bigger and bigger, they made a ton of money. The community gave to the festival, and then in exchange, the festival gave back to that community. And a lot of this is with the nonprofits. Uh, if you looked out of the food court area, that wasn't you know private businesses there trying to sell their food. That was that was all the different organizations. You know, that was the, the high school interact group trying to raise money for, to build houses in El Salvador. That was the, the Chesterfield Boy Scout troop coming in trying to raise funds so that, you know, kids could afford to go to camp that year. I almost always worked selling merchandise, which would raise money for the next year's festival. Um, and we'd be on our feet for many hours. But I have to say that was the most fun because People from out of town would come and just be so happy to be at the Pumpkin Festival. And so many people were like, I can't believe this is going on. And, and it kept getting bigger and bigger. I wanted to have something amazing. I wondered if we could build this tower out of scaffolding. And I had this friend, Jim Fippert, he worked at Brickstone Mason. And I went to Jim and I said, Jim, what would you think about building a tower with all these shelves for the pumpkins to, you know, to display the pumpkins for the pumpkin festival. And he was like, yeah, that's an awesome idea. So he started working on it. Um, the first one we built was 40 feet high, 40 feet wide. It held a thousand jack-o'-lanterns. So the morning of the 1993 pumpkin festival dawned and I was up very early and went down to Railroad Square because I knew that they were putting up the scaffolding. When I got to Railroad Square, it's gonna make me cry, but I got to Railroad Square and I saw this thing, it was amazing, was just amazing. They had already started putting the pumpkins up. It was clear to me that it was gonna look like a mass of pumpkins, not just a shelf on top of shelf. And I'll never forget that first year. People were coming downtown and they'd come around the corner and they'd see the tower and they were just like, oh my God. Oh my God, look at that, look at that. And I would just, I stood there and cried. It was awesome. My first memory of the Pumpkin Festival was the first year I opened the restaurant, which was in uh, 
August of 2000, people told me about how busy we would be for this, this huge event. Everybody started saying, Pumpkin Festival, be ready for it. You know, thousands and thousands of people coming to town. We're breaking records. Yeah, I think in the beginning, of course, it was um, the Pumpkin Festival was a small event. Um, and as it grew, our town is the reason that it grew because everybody got involved, everybody involved their children. It really was about the kids. This event was about kids. It was for kids and about kids. And we decided that wouldn't it be really cool if we actually gave kids pumpkins in the schools and had them carve the jack-o'-lanterns. By now, you know, businesses were having carving parties, Girl Scouts were having carving parties, Boy Scouts were having carving parties. It would be really cool to have the schools involved. So we contacted all the schools. The schools had ordered 4,000 pumpkins, and I had promised them that they would have 4,000 pumpkins. And in the past, what we had done is we had gone to different pumpkin fields in the area, and a lot of people, most of the owners of these fields would say to us, you can have whatever's left over in the field. And because we weren't giving them out to a lot of people in the early days, that was, that was great. The pumpkins were all rotten. Like we'd go to pick up a pumpkin and our hands would go right through it. And I thought, oh well, that's just a bad field. So we went to the next field and the same thing happened. So I started asking around and I found out that there was a blight on pumpkins in 1994 and that they were pretty hard to come by. Okay, I had just promised 4,000 pumpkins to the Keene schools. And by God, I was going to deliver them. Two days out before the day that the pumpkins were supposed to be delivered, I saw this, um, this little advertisement for pumpkins. And um, I called the number. This man answered. And his name was Walt Gladstone. Hi, I'm Walt Gladstone. Uh, my wife and I and two of my sons own Newmont Farm. We've been here since 1988. And I said, listen. I said, I know you grow pumpkins. I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but I need 4,000 pumpkins in Keene, New Hampshire in two days. And he said, no problem. <laughs> I said, what? I mean, that's what we do. He said, yeah, no problem. And I, I said, really? <laughs> I made him say it like five times. Sure enough, two days later, an 18-wheeler rolled into Keene, New Hampshire with 4,000 pumpkins and delivered them to the schools. And that was the start of a very, very long relationship with Walt Gladstone, who continued to provide us with pumpkins for years and years and years at the Keene Pumpkin Festival. There were no expectations other than carve a pumpkin and bring it down. That's all we asked of people. It didn't cost anything to come to the event. All we asked people to do was to carve a pumpkin and bring it downtown, stick a little candle in there. Not just were, was more of the community needed to be able to move the festival forward, but really it was, it was more the community wanted to be part of this. It was, it was such a big part uh, of Keene. You know, because we were trying to beat a Guinness World Record, it allowed us to say to everybody, hey, we need your pumpkin. We need you to carve a pumpkin and bring it down. You matter. And that was a pretty magical message for the Pumpkin Festival because lots of people feel in this world today that they don't matter. That, you know, they go to these big events, but who, they're just one little person in a huge crowd, but not at the Key Pumpkin Festival. Because if you brought your pumpkin down, you counted, you mattered. It mattered that your pumpkin was there and we needed it. Um, so really, there was a beautiful message in, in trying to break a Guinness World Record. And the community responded by creating amazing masterpieces. It was a great goose pimple feeling. Um, knowing you were needed, you put in your two cents worth of effort, and it all came together for the betterment of the entire area. More people got involved, and what I learned was, as more people got involved, it was all local people that were running this. It wasn't this big company that came in and ran Pumpkin Festival. It was it just kept growing by the people that got involved. You know, the nonprofit vendors were all volunteers. People who delivered the pumpkins helped Walt Gladstone deliver the pumpkins. We had a group of people that eventually went up to Newmont Farm and helped Walt pick the pumpkins. We had volunteers in almost all of the businesses who ran 
um, pumpkin parties and carving parties. We had the volunteers who set up the scaffolding, which is an absolutely huge job. We had people to count the pumpkins, people to light the pumpkins. It was really a community effort. Really, this was a volunteer effort. I mean, when the, when the festival started in the early 90s, uh, this was just some people that thought it would be kind of fun to have some pumpkins in one place and you know, started off in the hundreds of pumpkins and then thousands and then tens of thousands. And as it grew, the engagement for the community grew with it. It was like, what can I do? Well, we need people to do this. And, okay, I can handle that. Or uh, the scout troops would come and, and say, well, we'd like to take part. So it was just like a slow but steady avalanche of people who wanted to know, well, what can we do? What can we do? We had some very special volunteers, and one of them was Dexter Guyette. Dexter Guyette worked at Markham, and he loved the festival, and he was willing to do literally anything he could to make that event happen. Dexter and I were friends with Don and Nancy Sporborg. So Dexter, through Markham, worked every year on the, um, like setting up the pumpkins and set, setting up the scaffolding, and he was actually a member of the uh, pumpkin, the center stage board. And I'm telling you, he worked day and night working to make sure this festival happened. And he got Markham to basically donate their facilities department and all their guys to set up all the scaffolding in downtown Keene. I don't believe I've ever met anyone with a bigger heart. He had the ability to find whatever anybody needed um, and gave it freely. Uh, his time, first of all. Uh, both of us were really there from early Friday morning until late Sunday night. Dexter was so positive. He could get anybody to do anything. He was the kindest, gentlest soul I've ever met and he Everybody loved him, and all he had to do was look at you and give you this special little smile that he had, and people just, you know, their hearts melted. People would do anything for Dexter, and Dexter would do anything for the Pumpkin Festival. And he loved Keene. He just loved Keene. So Dexter lived in Keene his whole life, so the Keene community was really important to him, and he would do anything really to get involved in the community. And as the Pumpkin Festival got bigger and bigger, Dexter just really enjoyed participating in it. He knew how important it was to the um, nonprofits in the community. And that was really, it was just really important to him. Unfortunately, uh, Dexter was diagnosed with lung cancer, never smoked a day in his life. People started saying to him, Dexter, you're the reason that I volunteered for the Pumpkin Festival. I did it for you. Dexter called me and asked me to come talk to him. He was probably, probably it was about two weeks before he died. And he asked me if, he, if I would write a letter for him, a letter to the editor, have it get, put it in the paper for him. And I said, of course. And he talked to me about how, you know, people were saying that they volunteered for the Pumpkin Festival because of him and that he wanted to help people understand that he wanted people to do it for the community and for the Pumpkin Festival and to please continue to volunteer, um, to not stop uh, because he was dying. Um, and he, he basically said, this is, this is what I'm asking. This is, my, this is my legacy. Please, please don't stop volunteering. And um, so I wrote the letter to the editor and um, I sent it to the Keene Sentinel and I called the Keene Sentinel and I said, listen, um, this is a, a letter from someone who's got only, you know, days left and I'm really hoping that you can get it in as soon as possible. And they got it in the next day. While I was still running the Pumpkin Festival, I got a phone call from Life is Good and Life is Good said they loved the Keene Pumpkin Festival and would, they, would we be willing to share information. And in my book, the more pumpkin festivals there are in this world, the better off our world will be. So I very willingly shared every single thing that I could about the Keene Pumpkin Festival with Life is Good. And they ran a Life is Good Pumpkin Festival in Boston and set a world record, beat our world record 
uh, with a number of 30,128. Oh, it's never really settled well with me, a city of X million people uh, going and mass producing pumpkins and throwing them out on the common to say, oh, look at that, we beat a town of 25,000 that <laughs> this is literally part of our identity. Boy, that was a tough day for me. Uh, but again, I believe that the more pumpkin festivals there are in this world, the better off we'll be. But they had the world record and that was gonna be a problem for me until we brought it back to Keene. I'm Ruth Sterling and I took on the management of Keene Pumpkin Festival when uh, in 2010 it was announced that the previous organizers were going to stop. The first time I got serious about helping with a renewed Keene Pumpkin Festival when Center Stage made their announcement was when I saw a Facebook page, Help Don't Cancel Keene Pumpkin Festival. And social media was relatively new then. I had an intern at the time from Keene State College named Mackenzie, and Mackenzie printed out all the comments. And if you read those comments, I dare you to not want to jump in and save Keene Pumpkin Festival. The, the one that comes to mind right now is a veteran uh, overseas, deployed, um, fighting for America, <laughs> fighting for freedom, and he said, this is the kind of thing I'm over here fighting for. So families can go to an event like the Keene Pumpkin Festival and celebrate life and celebrate the season and don't you dare let that thing die. Well, you know, he was it was from from his keyboard to my ears and that that one um, comment took me a long way. And I saw it and I was, oh, well, I don't want the Pumpkin Festival to die. It's always something I really liked. So they said, hey, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to, trying to save this festival, trying to keep it going. This was something that I, I cared about. And so I said, sure, I'll help you out how, however I can. And so I kind of became a, just kind of a gopher during the day that first year. And uh, hey, I need this done, I need this. Could you run over here and get this for me? And I'd try to help out wherever I could. I wanted to do more. So, you know, when someone reached out uh, to me and said, hey, do you want to be involved in the Pumpkin Festival? I said, yeah. How about we help out with the marketing of it or being voices of it? So I enlisted Ted. So myself and Luca were, were tasked to kind of be local cheerleaders. And we kind of came up with a theme. Uh, we had a great marketing team at Let It Shine. Uh, Luca and I went to all the schools and we were uh, just really involved with cheerleading to try to get every single person to carve at least a pumpkin or two. Uh, we, had it, we called it No Pumpkin Left Behind. For the first festival we did, we were basically just assessing. We were going out. You know when you take on a new management of a new project, you kind of just give it your best shot the first time, knowing that by the third year, you're going to be really good at this. And the trouble with Keen Pumpkin Festival is you only have one day once a year to learn almost everything. I mean, you learn a lot the rest of the year with um, donors and fundraising and all sorts of other things, but the actual action of the fe festival, you learn the most the, the week of and the day of. Ruth came in and brought in a new dimension of uh, the festival itself. Clean up and the mess afterwards. The, um, there were always going to be some pumpkin shells afterwards the way we were doing it. So one day, had this idea that um, if you could break downtown into smaller pieces, we called them zones, and instead of 30,000 pumpkins, maybe you just cleaned up 3,000. And you have teams in each zone, and then you want it to be fast. You don't want them to take two days to do their zone. So what if you make it a race? And what if you get a sponsor to offer a big prize to the winner so there's this huge motivation to get those pumpkins cleaned fast. And what if you deploy a container, a waste container for composting those pumpkins, not trashing them, but composting them. And what if you have one in each zone and you have this race and you give the winner a thousand dollars? How fast could those pumpkins get cleaned up? And what's the answer? I think, I think it was 11 minutes. I think that the winner, um, the fastest winner was 11 minutes. It took like 15 minutes. It took 30 minutes for the slowest team. So we took the biggest problem of Keen Pumpkin Festival, well, besides that other problem, um, and we, uh, 
made it one of the funnest parts of the festival. I do remember how, how the Pumpkin Fest be kind of became a, a, um, a destination place for people all over the country. And uh, when we had first opened our store, we had invited the radio station to come down and set up a stage here in front of our business. And uh, it was about three feet high, so you could kind of stand up on the stage and look down Main Street and see the amount of people. And it was, um, I, I kind of, uh, I, I chuckled because it was essentially the equivalent of taking Fenway Park twice and putting it on Keene's Main Street. There were 70,000 people, and what an incredible way to celebrate Keene. It was just, uh, it was a memory and a, and a vision that I remember it was just so special to me. I loved every minute of it. The Pumpkin Festival became pretty famous quite fast, and I think it was the draw of how simple it was to carve a jack-o'-lantern and, and bring it to downtown Keene. It was simple. Everybody could do it. Everybody could participate. And it really captured people's hearts. We started getting national attention. I don't know, we were in this Japanese newspaper and all, all kinds of things. I kept collecting all the, the stuff throughout the United States as well. It was amazing. I think there was, a, there was an increased focus on amount of exposure the festival was getting from a, uh, you know, we were looking for new sponsors. So the festival started reaching out to more external sponsors such as Zippo and things like that. I think the, uh, the, 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 the notoriety of the festival started growing. We started getting more and more people from farther and farther and away saying, oh, this is really cool. We, we basically just said, okay, okay, that was that. Now let's, let's figure out all the ways we can improve, systemize and improve and streamline and maximize the potential of 2012. And right as you're making all those plans, right as you're um, saying, okay, we're gonna run a perfect pumpkin festival, you get a call from the people in Highwood, Illinois running a competing festival and they say, hey, do you wanna do a pumpkin wars? Have the property brothers come, have one brother go to Highwood, Illinois, have the other brother come to Keene and see if we can, you know, break the world record. Well, that just took about half our resources that we were gonna to use to perfect our pumpkin festival and devoted them toward a national television show and making sure we, that we were proud of Keene, New Hampshire when we watched that show. But it was, it was a few months ahead of time and we, we started working with them, making sure that we could uh, get all the logistics in place and okay, they're gonna show up here at this time of day and these are the things we want them to see, these are the things we don't want them to see. That became an overwhelming goal of 2012, to not embarrass Keene <laughs> on the nationally televised Pumpkin Wars on HGTV, but it brought in all sorts of other things. It was a very, very exciting time for Keene. Pumpkin Wars was coming to town. Well, once we heard that, we knew we wanted to be involved in some way, and I did too. So we reached out to Red Hour Industries and said, hey, you know, you could use the restaurant here for a place to get food for the staff. And if you need anything, let me know. And we became part of the group that got interviewed for it. Drew Scott, property brother, uh, was in Keene, New Hampshire for the Pumpkin Festival. How cool is that? What it did was people who had, were, oh yeah, Keene Pumpkin Festival, thousands of pumpkins, been there, done that, um, brought them all back. But it was a great way to focus on the community and what we did. And that was a blast. Um, we had such a great time filming that. And uh, one of the cool things that happened is that that just created more energy every day, right? So every time we were talking about it to our guests or uh, clients, I just to happened to have some people from CNS at an, an event that I was doing and I was cooking for them. And I just said, hey, did you hear about Pumpkin Wars? Did you hear about what we were doing to try and beat this other organ this other town? They go, how can we help? I said, well, get us some pumpkins. And that's where you hear Ted go, hey, we have a secret weapon. And I wasn't supposed to talk about it that day, and they brought it up. And it was 15,000 pumpkins from CNS. Oh, there's no question we have a shot at it. We have a secret weapon. Hold on, what was that? We have a secret weapon. Are you saying we're going to have an October surprise? Nobody knows about it except for Luca and I. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's top secret. We're not going there. I was getting phone calls. Drew Scott is down here on, on Central Square. you got to get down here and introduce yourself. 
It's already getting busy out there. This is good. There's a lot of people out here. Can I come for a photo with the, the scarecrow? This is exciting. This is what I'm talking about. This is the spirit here in Keene. You look very pretty but scary at the same time. A haunted cheerleader, I thought so. Nothing is better than a little festival food. Cotton candy, popcorn, gerbs, seeds. I don't even know what that is, but it sounds amazing. This is great. I cannot believe how many people are lying in the streets. So the first time I met him, I said to him, I feel like I should be asking you to renovate my bathroom or something, because I, you know, I'd seen him on TV. And he said, your bathroom would be much easier to renovate than this world record is going to be to get. I wish that all, it would, all we needed to do was uh, renovate your bathroom. So the idea was Highwood, Illinois and Keene would compete, see who could carve the most jack-o'-lanterns to set the next world record. So we were both trying to beat the world record that was set by Life is Good in Boston, which was 30,128. That was the number to beat. We had always been competing against ourselves. Uh, that had always been, you know, the, the years of creating the record and having Guinness come to town and we were breaking our own record and we broke our own record, what, 10, 11 times, I think. And uh, so having another town we actually were competing against was, it was very different. It was very exciting. Neither community reached that number, but uh, Pumpkin Wars aired and Keen won. And uh, they gave, I think it was a um, dollar per pumpkin to the community of Keene, and we gave the money out to nonprofits. It was amazing. Another aspect of our community getting together, right? It's some, we told someone, someone told someone else, and that's what goes on in this town. That's what makes Keene special. Um, you know, it was really clear to me that this community loved the festival and it, they had a stake in it. it. It wasn't mine, it wasn't Center Stages, it was Keene's. And people really gave everything they could. Everywhere I went, people said, whatever you need, Nancy, whatever you need, I'll do whatever. Everybody just stepped up. There are two dramatically different approaches to winning this war. Here in Keene, it's a grassroots effort. There are no assembly lines, no gutting mills. It's bigger than just, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna do all this and we're gonna make it happen and we have to make these connections. It was just conversations. And that was the most fun about the whole event was one conversation led to another, all these people got involved and we won, right? Pumpkin Wars was a killer. And it just it, it knocked it out of the park and we, we had a great time as a community. Beginning of 2013, we were contacted by Sandy Hook. We were in the process of getting, you know, all our ducks in order to run the 2013 Pumpkin Festival and got this call from a woman named Lisa Rose who told us that she lived in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. And Sandy Hook had just gone through a horrendous experience. They had a, um, a gunman who shot 20 children and six adults in an elementary school in Sandy Hook. And the whole country, the whole world really was devastated. And she called and she asked if we would help her with giving her information about how to run a pumpkin festival. She wanted to bring the pumpkin festival to Sandy Hook to help the community heal. And of course, we said, absolutely, we'll do anything we can. We went to a meeting with them and one of the women that was at the meeting had lost her son. It was everything Ruth and I could do not to cry through the whole experience. But we gave them all the information and all the help we could. We hooked their fire department up with our fire department so they could learn the ropes of how to keep the event safe. And um, they ran a pumpkin festival in 2013. Uh, my husband and I went. It was uh, really emotional experience. All the parents of the kids who had died had all set up charities for their children and the charities were everywhere and it was just really tough. But it was also beautiful that this community was stepping back into life through pumpkins, that they came out. There were lots of people there and it was a beautiful thing to be a part of. It was really just an honor to have been just a tiny little part of that event wasn't a beautiful city festival like we 
dream about here to, to revitalize a downtown, but it was to heal. What could be worse to heal from than the loss of children? We did carve 26 angels. Um, John Hayes, our, our board member lawyer, he, he and his family stepped up and made sure there were 26 angels on the tower. The people um, flipped the switch, the people from Sandy Hook flipped the switch on the tower. Yeah, we will always be tied to Sandy Hook. So the fact that Boston continued to hold the world record for the largest number of lit jack-o'-lanterns at 30,128 really ate away at me. Some people went down to Boston and found that all of the pumpkins were truly not hand-carved and scooped out uh, with a decoration of some sort on it. Some were just painted. So there was some controversy there as to whether or not they should even be counted. We saw some of those pumpkins, those weren't really carved. You can't drill a hole in the front of it and call it a jack-o'-lantern when you're doing that as a mass production effort. Anyways, I'm not bitter. <laughs> so in 2012, when the uh, Pumpkin Wars episode aired on HGTV, I think we were within like 500 pumpkins of breaking the world record. So uh, there was so much momentum going into the following year to try to actually bring home the record. Because we didn't break the record in 2012 when the Property Brothers were here, we decided to make it a real effort in 2013 to bring the record home. Um, and we made hats and shirts and t-shirts and sweatshirts that said bring it home. And everybody wore them and we contacted Walt Gladstone and asked for some ungodly amount of pumpkins that year. We probably sent down between 25 plus thousand pumpkins and uh, it was it was huge. I think there was this kind of upswell of, oh my gosh, we need to do this again. Families were having, you know, pumpkin carving parties. I know we had carved 500 pumpkins at my house with like 40 people. And team cannot be beaten when that many people come together for one thing. That community has always come together and said, we will do it. And God help anybody who tries to stop them. We said, okay, October 20 something, 2013, we are gonna stand on the Keen Bandstand and we are gonna announce a world record. How do we get there? How did we get there? Let's, let's consider it a fact and let's back up from there and figure out how we get there undeterred, nothing stopping us. So I, I, we used to say that we're gonna bring it home and there's gonna be no stopping us. Because we were working so hard at um, breaking this record, we contacted Guinness and Guinness had <clears throat> decided to set some very strict standards now that it was becoming a thing and now that Highwood was trying and so <clears throat> they required that all the jack-o'-lanterns be lit at one time. What? That's, I said, that's not, that's not going to happen. That's not possible. They said, that's, that's the record. All the jack-o'-lanterns have to be lit at once. <clears throat> and we just pulled out the stops, did everything we could to make sure that everybody knew that we were trying to beat the record. We gave as many pumpkins away as we possibly could. Luca Paris and I, we, we got to do some radio ads. They were kind of quirky, yet kind of funny, but we visited every single school around here in their, uh, in their gymnasiums uh, doing this, you know, no pumpkin left behind, we're gonna let it shine. part was not relying on light lit candles, supplementing lit candles with candles that could not be extinguished by rain. The other part is to put someone like Nancy Sporborg in charge of the count. We um, set up a real system to count the jack-o'-lanterns. We had what we call the light brigade that lit all the jack-o'-lanterns. Everybody would help light and there's real symbolism in that. So we had a light brigade, we had teams of people who were going to count the jack-o'-lanterns. We divided downtown Keene into sections and each team had a section of jack-o'-lanterns. They had maps and then the idea was is that we had literally 10 minutes. We sounded this horn, we had 10 minutes to count the jack-o'-lanterns that were not lit. 
and subtract them from the total number that we had counted earlier in the day. And everybody had their assignment, everybody knew what they were doing. So that would account for, you know, that this was the way we were going to meet Guinness's requirement that all the jack-o'-lanterns be lit at once, that we were going to count the ones that weren't lit. I mean, the people that were lighting pumpkins and everybody in the community, I mean, we begged. We said, hey, you guys, go for it. If you see a jack-o'-lantern not lit, light it. And we're talking, everybody, we're talking, you know, someone who just arrived from Massachusetts to see the pumpkins saying, here, light those. And it became like that. It was a mass effort to have those pumpkins be lit. I mean, literally, there were hundreds of people lighting jack-o'-lanterns. It was amazing. It was just the most incredible um, effort to be a part of, to feel that energy. It was amazing. As the event manager, I can carve one pumpkin and I can light, you know, maybe 50, but it is the coming together of every hand and every lighter and every everything that might work. So we sounded the horn, the teams counted the uh, jack-o'-lanterns that weren't lit, and then we all met back at the fire station, all the teams that were counting, and we had a big whiteboard, and we just, team by team, we called them up and asked them, total number they counted, number of jack-o'-lanterns not lit, total number lit. And we had a person in the back with this calculator um, adding up the numbers. And what what an amazing effort that was. I'm telling you that you could cut the tension with a knife. I, I didn't know if I should laugh or cry. I didn't know what to do. I, could, I basically couldn't breathe. We all were um, so stressed and so tense. And um, when the last team checked in um, and the guy put it in the calculator, <laughs> oh my God, 30,581. And we erupted, everybody just erupted. It was, there were tears and people were hugging and oh my God, it was just, it was a really a moment for me. There was just the, the best feeling ever was uh, when I got a call from Ruth to say, get up to the gazebo, gazebo right now. We have uh, the Guinness Book people here. We're gonna make the announcement. I think we've done it. And um, you know, that kind of, you know, I had to be really quiet and run up to the gazebo from my store, which was packed downtown and, and dodging through 70,000 people. Then we came back out on Central Square to announce the number. And, you know, Ruth Sterling was there and she looked at me, <laughs> she looked at me with these eyes. It was like, come on, Nance, tell me. And I gave her this thumbs up and, and I said, oh my God, we won, we won. It, really, the, we announced it from Central Square and it was packed. You, there, there were people, I mean, if you can picture it, there were people all the way down Main Street. It was packed, you literally, could not um, get close to Central Square. To announce that count with all of the, um, everybody holding their breath, waiting to hear throughout the whole footprint of the festival. There was so much anticipation. And you've got to remember that most of the people that were here, or a good number of people that were at the festival, they carved their jack-o'-lantern. This was their record. This was theirs. They wanted to know they did it. And, um, they announced the number. Before we announced the number, I said to everybody, I said, listen, I said, this was a community effort. I want you, no matter whether you know the person in front of you or behind you or whatever, I want you to pat the back of the person closest to you. And um, people were hugging and, <laughs> and um, we announced the number, 30,581, and the roar was amazing. 30,500. <laughs> Dreamers have this thing about, they go, I'm gonna start this and I never know where it's gonna be. And I thought about that moment where, what if Nancy Sporborg was out here in, and when Pumpkin Wars happened or when we broke the record that next year, did she look at it and go, I can't believe we're here and I can't believe this many people have been affected and, and she must feel really good about this. It was more than I could have ever dreamed. I, I think I cried for 24 hours. I was just so ecstatic. It was just such a moment to have the record back in Keene, New Hampshire, and to know that 
this community had really stepped up. That is what's so special about Keene. It's why I love it here. People step up. They step up, they do what they need to do, and they do it with just energy and positivity and caring, and um, ah, it was an amazing moment. Uh, that was a really proud moment for, I think, our town, our city, our, our people, our children, um, and inevitably, you know, that, that momentum from HGTV national coverage uh, carried through to next year, and it just really was just uh, such a proud moment for Keene. From the very first moment I became involved with thinking about managing Keen Pumpkin Festival, we identified that the single greatest threat to the festival's future was the behavior of college-age people, specifically alcohol-impaired college-age people. So we set about, we had a whole campaign that we developed to um, try to call attention to the problem. I was a lifeguard at a pool in high school and college, and a, a lifeguard's job is to keep everybody safe while having an excellent time. So I truly believe it's possible. And I approached it like that all the time. But what a lifeguard does is sets, sets a tone of safety. You do not mess with lifeguards. They will kick you out of the pool or they will kick you off the beach, or they will embarrass you in front of everybody. So we would set a tone of, don't mess with these pumpkins. Do not mess with this fest. I went and, went and stood for two, three hours at one of the bars on a Saturday night, <laughs> handing out materials, talking to people, just saying, hey, let's not, let's not do this. <laughs> we know that it's a party weekend. The year before, there had been issues on Winchester Court. We, we had a campaign to reach out to parents. Do not let your, your college-age kids go to Keene, New Hampshire on, on Pumpkin Festival weekend. Stop them. Tell them they're not allowed to go. We, we tried to stem it. We tried to work with Keene State early on and say, hey, we need to stop this before it starts. We had these things called face-off forums where we got together with the students and told them our we, we put our cards on the table. This festival is going to die, and it's going to because, be because of some drunk college age behavior. That is what's going to make this festival die. I said it for five years, and you know, no one likes to be right about something like that. You don't like to be right. So 2014 came. We were very excited about running the Pumpkin Festival. It was an amazing event. It was filled with just incredible volunteers and this people of this community carving pumpkins and tens of thousands of people from out of state who had the opportunity to come into Keene and see what a small community can do when it puts all its efforts and energy into something greater than itself. That, year, that year's festival was possibly the tightest run, best, most well-organized, least problematic festival we had, we had had in years. It was just a beautiful day. I remember looking out front of our store and just seeing families and um, camaraderie and just uh, so much uh, just positive uh, vibes, if you will. It was one, another year that was great. I mean, I stood in Central Square looking out, having all these same feelings all the time. Uh, we got interviewed out front, Ted and I, at one point. We did a walk around. I did the same thing I do every year with my family. And thousands and thousands of people here. People having an amazing time. Things getting, it's, it was, everything was the same. There was no difference. And honestly, until we started hearing reports about what was happening off the footprint of Pumpkin Fest, didn't even know what was going on. So the 2014 festival came off without a hitch. It was awesome, and very close to the end of the Pumpkin Festival, Lou Sterling, who was running the event, came up to me with tears in her eyes and said, Nancy, you better walk around and look at this for the last time, because this is probably the last time you're ever going to see it, and told me that there were riots happening um, around Keene State College. <laughs> Thank you.
We were told at one o'clock that there was a mass casualty situation in Keene, outside the footprint in the college-aged neighborhoods. Okay, so for about an hour and a half, I thought mass casualty meant deaths. I am still not very happy with <laughs> the emergency response officer who shared that information with me and then left me there to run an event for 50,000 people, thinking that I was responsible for people dying. That uh, just put a, a pit in my stomach. It really concerned me. I was just flabbergasted. I just, it was beautiful, it was quiet, it was, everything was, there were tons and tons of people here, probably they estimate 60,000 to 70,000 people in downtown Keene. I feel like I'm responsible for people dying and um, we have to go ahead with pumpkin bowling and we have to go ahead with the count. You know, the next act is coming up to perform for you on the bandstand and I was notified we had periodic security drills and or um, check-ins and I was notified that there was not a single police officer left in the footprint that um, the pumpkin festival team the lifeguards were the only security in the footprint because the footprint was that safe and the college neighborhood was that unsafe at that moment. We started hearing that there was um, a lot of drinking, a lot of parties, a lot of police ac activity down there. And so we brought our children home, our grandchildren home, because we were just nervous about that. Um, and then we listened and watched it on TV. Um, I would have fought anyone to keep that area safe. And I think that you'll see if you go to YouTube, um, you'll see that I did fight anyone and everyone who tried to endanger that footprint. Ruth Sterling, who is the festival coordinator, is on site here uh, and is being, uh, uh, well, she's not letting me do my job and to report to you. She would not like me to tell you what is going on at Keene State College. Now I'm being called a free stater. This is a family-friendly event. The footprint of Keene Pumpkin Festival is 100% safe. We have a bigger crowd than we've ever had. I want them to have a wonderful evening and not be disturbed by people who aren't even at the Pumpkin Festival. So if you think that inciting these people is a good idea, I am going to pull the plug on you because you are here as a guest of Keen Pumpkin Festival and I assigned you this spot. You heard it here first, Do everybody. Not when you alarm our guests. Thank you. When you report the news, when you report the reality, the people in charge want to shut you down. This is against freedom of the press, folks. We have been bringing you coverage all day. Yes, Ruth is correct that this festival is very important for Keene. We have been reporting that all day long. Then pull the plug. But pull the plug. agency, and you have no right to self-promote here, darling. I'm not self-promoting anything. Yes, you are. Do we agree he's self-promoting? I agree. Yeah. Everybody, Ruth Sterling, the festival organizer of the Keene Pumpkin Festival censoring local media from the truth of what is happening outside the footprint. I wish I didn't have to do that. <laughs> he started loudly sending that out to, to a very big crowd. To me, that was a First Amendment problem. He was yelling fire in the middle of a movie theater. And I have a journalism degree, and my journalism degree said, He's committing a crime. You stop him, Ruth. No one else is going to stop him. There's no police to stop him. There's no city staff to stop him. No one else knows the Constitution. <laughs> You're going to have to stop him, or there will be a mass exodus. And we were trained in all of these protocol meetings that the worst thing that could happen at a pumpkin festival was a mass exodus. Everyone trying to, you know, something like at the Boston Marathon that caused everybody to, to stampede. Had no clue what was going on. And you hear little reports, oh, there was this, there was a disturbance at the college, and that, that, and none of that really seemed to be a big deal. Then the night started taking over. Young people danced on a flipped over car Saturday night, while others tore down traffic signs, set fires in the street, 
and through bottles and cans near the pumpkin festival in Keene, New Hampshire. We cleaned up, we went home, and then I started getting messages from people that said that um, it's on national news that there are riots in downtown Keene. A New Hampshire city became the scene of rioting this weekend involving hundreds of people. At least 30 were hurt, dozens were arrested. The violent parties that led to dozens of injuries and arrests at Keene State College. The media picked up on the riots and had footage of the riots and they called them the pumpkin festival riots. After the whole pumpkin riot happened in Keene, New Hampshire, a reporter... Fun turned to chaos this weekend in New Hampshire. The site, the annual Keene Pumpkin Festival. So I want to be really, really clear. Those riots did not take place at the Keene Pumpkin Festival. They took place on Lower Main Street, closer to Keene State College campus. And they were <clears throat> some Keene State College kids, but lots of kids from outside of Keene State. These weren't... Keene State students doing this, this wasn't even their friends doing this. This was their friends of their friends. That's where the problems came in. It was, and it was just, oh, I heard there's a rager in Keene this weekend. It was, their whole intent was to start this mess. They had nothing to do with pumpkins, no interest in pumpkins, no interest in community, no interest in Keene. And that's why it's problematic to me when people call these the, the pumpkin fest riots. I remember going home the evening of the, the 2014 Pumpkin Festival and, and um, obviously it was, um, it was a sad ending. It was a sad ending on a lot of different levels. They want to pick up as much negative press as they can so they ran with it and um, you know it, it wasn't all positive that day, that's for sure. I was heartbroken. I was heartbroken. Well. As I said, I have a degree in journalism. I've made a career in public relations, and I know that every crisis is an opportunity. So whatever the national press said, whatever mis misnomers on um, words like riot or um, blaming Keene State College, all of that, um, I don't use those words. I, I do not blame. Um, I blame college-age students impaired by alcohol. I do blame them, <laughs> college-age students, um, and the people responsible for them, which includes their college, college administrations. Colleges have stepped up and taken responsibility for their students on and off campus and said, if you have a wild party and you have people naked on your roof, that will affect your college career in a big way. Well, if that had been the case in 20, you know, in the 2010s or before, if that tone had been set, we would not be having this discussion in this way. We would still have the world famous Keen Pumpkin Festival happening. The writing on the wall was pretty clear. Um, when the city council got together to talk about, you know, we applied for an event license and the city council denied it. And I was furious at the city council. We had all kinds of people from the community come and speak for the festival. All sorts of people came out to talk to the city council that night. Um, volunteers, kids, people who had um, worked at the festival for years and benefited. Their nonprofit ran on the money they made at the festival. They'd be lost without the festival. At, oh gosh, the appeals were incredible. I sat there in the chair and poured my heart out to them and the chair of the committee we were speaking to very visibly rolled his eyes and sat back in his chair and looked away from me as I was trying to explain to them the economic impacts of this to the town and after that, and that I don't remember when that was exactly in the year but then that fall uh, when elections came around I, that's when I first decided to try to run for, for city council because I realized that we can't have a council that completely dismisses r rational economic <laughs> rational economic arguments for for allowing a festival to continue. Unfortunately, uh, the city council chose to blame the pumpkin festival instead of maybe who deserved the blame and um, denied us a event license. And um, I remember sitting in the city council, I just sat there with tears in my eyes. I couldn't believe that the city council 
couldn't see the beauty that the festival brought Keen, and instead was going to abolish it. A fellow from Laconia that runs um, Laconia Motorcycle Week called and said, we would take that in a heartbeat. We would love, we would welcome that with open arms. Well, Charlie was right. About 20 other cities wrote to us and said that they would love to have the festival in their town, places in Vermont, Massachusetts, all over. The appeal of the visuals of Keene Pumpkin Festival's Festival is the backdrop of a beautiful city, a beautiful quintessential New England city, old city. And you put that on Hampton Beach and it's just another festival. Laconia downtown was having dark days also, like Keene was when Nancy started the festival. So in a way there was a close parallel and in a way their footprint was similar. Laconia was ready, willing and able and so we did that. So remember, for 14 years, I looked out and saw this beautiful event every year in October, and I was looking forward to it. Uh, the first October that it wasn't here, after those 14 years, for me, was, was sad, you know? And I, and I missed it, and I understand why, and I, some parts I do understand, some parts I don't, but, but it was gonna continue, and it continued in Laconia. You know, after a, a year or two hiatus in this area, people felt it. They felt the same thing I did when I looked out on the, uh, the end of October and looked out in the streets and it was just an October day and should have been Pumpkin Fest that day. Since then, we've tried to bring the Pumpkin Festival back. It's come back very, very small, but uh, the city has been really tough on us. The rekindled smaller footprint festival came to be here. And I thought it was a great thing. It was so manageable, so small, no sleep lost, um, really beautiful participation, great number of volunteers, as I said, from the college and the high school and others. And so it was good, but it did rain two years. And it, that just really starts feeling like nature's kind of not helping you out. So we found out that the Let It Shine board was um, interested in interested in kind of stepping back again. Um, the pumpkin festival for the children that had been going on for the last uh, three four years. It was it was a nice festival. It was it was nice. The kids enjoyed it. It was a couple thousand pumpkins. Uh, this was basically an effort to to keep something alive. Um, and create something that was really, really for the kids, uh, for the neighborhood kids. And, and they were the only ones who were allowed to bring pumpkins to this. A new board with some new energy is, is now in place. And we're, we're really hoping to, to, to find a happy medium here. Um, we, we want more than just Central Square and just kids being allowed to bring pumpkins. We know there's a lot of businesses in town and uh, nonprofits and, and families that would like to, like to contribute like to contribute to their downtown, like to contribute to Keene, and contribute to something that's really, quite honestly, very fun. But at the same time, not, not be competitive. We're not trying to break any records anymore. If it happens accidentally, sure. But it's hard to accidentally end up with 30,000 jack-o'-lanterns, so I don't expect that. But really what we want to create is also a, an event where we can help the community. We can bring in the nonprofits again that we didn't have for years during the smaller festival. We want to bring them back in. We know how much this, this festival will benefit them. And then we want to bring in some of the aspects of the old festival that were really, really uh, emblematic of the festival. So the, the big tower downtown, we're probably not going to have it quite as tall the first year, but we'd like to bring back the tower. We'd like to bring back, you know, pumpkins lining the streets. This, these are things that you allow people to go and explore. So the idea is how do we make something that everyone can enjoy, everyone benefits from, but we're not going so overboard that we're, we're going to start attracting unwanted entities into Keene. In the 20 years that I've been involved with Pumpkin Festival, when it was here, when it was not here, when it's coming back, I was a restaurateur. Now, 
I'm the president of the Chamber of Commerce, an organization that wants to build more community, create more community, and bus bring businesses here and, and just see that energy all the time. So when I heard that Pumpkin Festival is coming back under a different banner as far as the leadership, as far as the energy, uh, I reached out right away. And, you know, I've talked to the, the, the people putting that together and said, you know, why don't we start meeting at the Chamber and let's start creating the energy around this now. I've seen people take the Pumpkin Festival and make it into a, a money maker or, you know, a, way, a, a place where everybody's drinking and partying. I, I've seen lots of different communities do different things with it. And I know that I wanted an event that would benefit the community and would be of the community. I wanted it to have heart. And um, I don't, I know that there's this a woman who's interested in um, taking over Let It Shine. And I, I hope, I hope she keeps the heart in the event. There was a family and the father or grandfather planted uh, pumpkin seeds and he grew the pumpkins. And then um, when it was time to harvest them, he died. And so the kids took the pumpkins and um, carved them and brought them down to the pumpkin fest. But they saved the seeds. And every year after that, they went and planted the seeds and brought those down. It had brought the family together. Now, if you can bring a family together over a pumpkin seed or two, it is really kind of nice to see that you can bring an entire region together. It created a lot of tradition and love and togetherness, I think, for this community as well as for my own family. Um, we had a ball. You really can't say enough about the magical genius of Keen Pumpkin Festival because it is built on some incredible foundations. The amount of energy that this thing inspired people to give cannot be underestimated. It has to be revered. The Pumpkin Festival is kind of, kind of was what put Keen on the map but I don't think it would have happened in many other places. I, I don't know if it could happen at this scale anywhere else in the world. The Pumpkin Festival, it, it is it is keen. Uh, that, there's no better way really to say it. It brought so much joy to so many people um, and it was really sorely missed uh, with that kind of black mark on it. I believe that, that the soul that that festival had, it still lives in Keen and, and it always will. And I think the world needs to show the soul that Keen has. For 24 years, the Keen Pumpkin Festival brought joy and community spirit and a feeling that each person who carved a pumpkin mattered. It brought pride to our community and it put Keen on the map. And it put Keen on the map because we are a special community and because we have incredible people who live here who have heart and who recognized the heart of the Keen Pumpkin Festival and were willing to step up and make it theirs. That's what made it special is that the people in this area made it theirs and they made it beautiful and they volunteered and they carved and they baked and they cooked and they, you know, built scaffolding and sold food and counted and lit jack-o'-lanterns. I mean, it just was an incredible community effort. And I think what the Keen Pumpkin Festival did is it, it kind of shined a light on who we all are in Keen. And I'll, I'll hold on to that forever.